two types of faces that she's just genetically primed to recognize. Not a lot of apes around here, so she lost the ape ability, but you know, she instantly locks in on my face and is always probing it to see kind of what's, you know, what's going on, as much as she can comprehend. But when we are young or just when we're looking at faces as a normal person, um, we're looking at faces for one thing and one thing only. We're looking at a face to see what's going on. Am I going to be able to get something out of this person? Uh, is, is there some kind of harm coming some, my way? Is there some kind of good coming my way? Uh, if you haven't researched a guy named Paul Aikman, you need to research Paul Aikman. I took a uh, FACS, I think is what they call it, F-A-C-S uh, course with the only woman authorized to train by Paul. Uh, she works directly with him. And I took her course uh, and was just fascinated by the amount of stuff that, um, the, just the amount of stuff, the amount of ways that you can distill expression, the way you can look at expression. Um, they have these things called action units, which are basically uh, muscle movements or combinations of muscle movements. And action units are then used to code a person's face, and from there it's used to just define an emotion. So basically, the premise that Paul Aikman is using is that the face doesn't lie. Or if it lies, it has to do something to lie. And so you can see it. And uh, that is just a, a ton of information to go in and study and learn uh, and has a, a wealth of information for us. But what we're going to focus on today is the, is the sculpting reality. And that is how do you even you know, get something that's realistic? How do you remap what an eye looks like to, um, to, to be something you know, that somebody next to you will recognize? Uh, let me see. Okay. Along these lines, I also want to talk about something else that was really important. Going to Paul or um, going to the FACS workshop was all wrapped up into something that I call going pro. Another guy you need to check out, Stephen Pressfield. He's got a book called The War of Art. Not The Art of War, The War of Art. And that's wrapped up in with Paul Aikman. It's wrapped up with uh, anatomy. It's wrapped up with whenever we start as artists to get serious about what we're doing. So the question I want you to think about today is, are you an amateur or are you a pro? Are you approaching your art like an amateur? Is this a hobby? Is this just something you have nothing invested in? Uh, is this something that um, you know you could give or take? Uh, is it something that if it starts to frustrate you, you just give it up? You know, or is this something that you are wholeheartedly involved in? You know, the the questions you want to ask yourself are: uh, Do you show up and work every single day? no matter what happens. Is this something you have a set time, a ritual, you wake up in the morning, you go right to your desk and you start to sculpt. You sculpt for three hours, you don't care what happens. Or do you let yourself get distracted with research? One of the really important things about this amateur and pro decision or, uh, uh, dichotomy is this idea of resistance. Uh, amateurs let resistance get to them. Pros live with resistance. It's what you deal with. It's your enemy. You know day in and day out you have to fight it. So you need to look for the ways that resistance kind of manifests in your life. One of the ways it manifested for me is I'd start projects and I'd research literally for three days on the internet and then decide I was kind of bored with the subject because I was bored with the subject because I'd researched it for three days. What you want to do is just get in and start to sculpt. Another question, do you know your weaknesses? Are you ruthless? Do you know where your strengths and your weaknesses are? Or do you only know your strengths? Do you only know what is, uh, what is good about your work? Do you shy away from those areas that are bad? You have to reinforce this positive critic. Now, a lot of, all of us, we have this critic inside us. But 
do you have a positive critic or at least you know a negative critic that you can bounce around with and have a beer with do you have some part of you that is looking at your work and saying well that's not the best but this is why and this is what you could do um, and go from there uh, do you eat failure for breakfast lunch with adversity right the idea is that a pro is always at it they're always facing difficulty we are dealing with an art when you get in and you start to learn the face you're going to be encountering an enormous amount of problems the complexity of the human face is both simple and in infinitely complex if you have it presented to you in an easy to digest manner then you're in great shape if you don't you're in trouble the other question I want you to think about is would you be doing this if nobody else was I remember back when um, I first wanted to do stuff with the computer I didn't know anything about the computer I you know just like everybody else I'd had that Apple computer when I was young or I would played with the Atari something like that but I didn't know anything about it but I did know that if Leonardo or Michelangelo were around today they would be using the computer in some way no questions hands down Leonardo used the most advanced technology he could in his case it was oil painting which was an advancement over egg tempura Michelangelo was marble carving and he was marble carving in very complex pieces out of you know these blocks of marble that basically nobody thought were usable so he's using technology he's using science to create his art. I am 100% confident they would be using the computer. And digital sculpting for me is this evolution of, uh, of what we can do as artists. Not a replacement, but an evolution. The key to me for going pro, as I mentioned earlier, the key for me taking myself more seriously in my art was anatomy. Anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. It was combined with Paul Aikman where I learned not just anatomy but how anatomy becomes combined with uh, facial action units and how those help me understand expression and how I can use those as a sculptor to sculpt expression. Uh, but there's always this question, what is anatomy? So let me ask you guys while I, I go on to the next thing. Give me a shout out in the questions. What do you think anatomy is? I want to hear from everybody what is anatomy how would you uh, define it a lot of times you think of muscles okay everybody thinks of muscles to some extent study the human body I'm hearing more muscles occasionally anatomy means other things but usually it's muscles the first thing that pops into your head when you say anatomy is some muscle. First thing that pops into my head when I say anatomy is a bicep. But one of the things that um, we have to keep in mind as artists is that and muscles are really only one part of a complex uh, structure. And that's one of the things I'm seeing here in chat. There's a lot of people who are hitting it right on the head. It is um, the study of muscles, but it's also the study of form. It's the study of how uh, form relates to muscles. It's the study of structure. Structure is like the engineering of uh, the human body. It's joints and how the muscles work with each other. Uh, anatomists or uh, anatomy teachers like Gottfried Bams are really good for the structure of the human body. He break, breaks everything up into planes, uh, creates mechanical drawings for everything. Really solid uh, sense of structure. Other guys are better for just helping you understand where muscles are, things of that. Um, there's a lot of resources for studying anatomy, a lot. Okay, uh, but learning anatomy is really a huge task, especially when you're learning from these books like this. Uh, so I want to, I want you to start with a, a, just a premise. When you're learning anatomy, when you're learning sculpting like this, you start out completely lost and what I want to do over the next uh, couple of minutes is I'm gonna start walking you through uh, how you're going to get yourself out of being lost and then we'll start uh, sculpting inside of ZBrush uh, so first you have to know you're lost 
you're just some guy ran out in the middle of the wilderness, maybe has a map, maybe doesn't have a map, maybe has a compass, maybe doesn't have a compass, but when you start to sculpt the face for the first time, you're, you're really lost. So I want to take a side trip here. Uh, the sculpting experiences and the limitation of the conscious mind. So I'm going to go a little new age on you guys here. But it's important because I want you to understand where our problems as sculptors are coming from. Why are we having this problem where we're looking at form, we keep going back, looking at the model, looking at the sculpt, looking at the images, looking at the sculpt. We're constantly going back and our model doesn't look like our sculpt or uh, doesn't look like the, um, the images, the reference or the model. You have to keep in mind that your conscious mind, you know, basically the thinking part of us, it has limitations, okay? Whether these numbers are accurate or not, we can be aware that the mind, just that conscious part of us, it has limitations. Impulses travel at 100 miles per hour through the body. Well, it's kind of fast. Uh, focus on only one to three events at a time. Okay, that's really important because that's a backlog. Okay, when you're sculpting, you got more than one to three events going on. You got a nose, you got an eye, you got a, like the curvature of the eye. You've got the inner eye, the outer eye, uh, the outer eye up above, the outer eye down below. Okay, conscious mind's processing two thousand bits of information per second. What's a bit of information? Right? Think about it this way. A 1,000 uh, polygon model, just a 1,000 polygon model, just in order to store all of the bits of position, uh, uh, all the bits of vertices, storing their positions in space, that requires 3,000 bits of information. So your conscious mind can't even hold a 1,000 polygon model in the brain at one time. So they say. Okay. The other thing you need to keep in mind is something they call the psychological present. All right, we're nearing the end of the new age, but the psychological present's 12 seconds, they say. What is the psychological present? Basically, it's how long you can remain aware of what you're doing before your brain resets, or you need to go back and look at the memory of something 12 seconds ago. So if you're sculpting, and you find yourself looking at the model, looking at the model, looking at the model, and you're absorbing everything that's going on, and then you go and you start to sculpt on your model, you start to sculpt on your clay, you basically have 12 seconds before now you need to make sure you need to go back to memory. And that's where you need to be building all of these things in your brain. The consciousness gap, something like the eye transmits 10 million bits of, in, uh, of information, your conscious mind is processing 2,000 bits. So all the rest of that information goes somewhere. Okay? It's going into your subconscious. Okay? It's going into the back of your head, let's say. I, we don't need to get all uh, um, flowery on it. It's going into the back of your head. You are processing or you are, be, you are aware of a lot more information than you can in any single moment break down and make sense of. You're just aware of it, but you're not breaking it down and making sense of it. So the subconscious mind is 100,000 miles per hour. That's how fast these things are traveling. And it's 20 million bits of information per second. That is, I don't know how many 1,000 polygon models, but it's retaining, obviously, a lot of it. The other thing to keep in mind is that it works in terms of pictures and patterns. It doesn't judge truthfulness. It just accepts everything and works with pictures and patterns. Okay, but our job as sculptors is to get as much information into the back of our head as possible so that when we are sculpting, things are happening automatically and we are not consciously focused on how the eye is shaped or every bit of how the eye is shaped. Of course, when you're beginning, you have no choice. You have to focus on everything little bit by little a bit. So what you have to do is you have to start mapping the wilderness. You have to start naming things. And that's why I really feel strongly about learning anatomy. I did not always feel this way. I used to feel that you didn't need to know anatomy. I used to feel that, you know, it was just a bunch of, uh, you know, 
hotty toddy people talking Latin, and I didn't really feel like learning Latin. I still don't feel like learning Latin. I hate learning some of these names sometimes. Okay? The German language uses a totally different structure. And what we're doing, what they do is they just call it, say, the, uh, the arm bone, or it's the upper arm bone, or something like that. At least that's how it was explained to me. But it's different than Latin. There is a structure to Latin, though, and to anatomy that once you learn it, makes your life easier. But at the end of the day, whatever you have to do, you have to learn anatomy, and you have to name things. If you want to call it the nose muscle, if you want to call it, say, the depressor anguli, if you want to call that the corner of the mouth muscle, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. It'll be hard for you to communicate to somebody else, but if you don't care about that, then call it the corner of the mouth muscle. doesn't matter, but you have to name it. If you create two or more names, then you begin to create a pattern, and you begin to create a map. And maps are how you get this information into the back of your skull. You have to start to develop a coordinate system that just sits in the back of your skull where you have a 3D version of this, of any face, of a generic face, of an old face, of a, of a young face. You have to have 3D versions of all of these in the back of your head so that you can sculpt a face in 30 minutes. I went to a workshop with Richard McDonald. If you don't know Richard McDonald, he's um, probably the most collective figurative sculptor uh, working today. Beautiful, beautiful work. And uh, Richard McDonald is just a powerhouse of a human being. Uh, when he went in to sculpt a portrait, it took him a half hour, 45 minutes. He had a likeness. He had the guy's hat, the guy's hair. He had the guy's eyes, nose, ears, lips. He had everything. It was all done in 45 minutes. And then he goes on and sells that sculpture for probably, I think, uh, I remember I'd see either $20,000 or something like that in a limited edition of, ooh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, something like 80. Okay, that's, that's the kind of position you and I want to be in. We want to be in a position where we, it takes us a half hour to make a sculpt, we put it in our gallery, and then the gallery sells 80 of them at $20,000 each uh, while we're in the Bahamas uh, in our vacation home, right next to Richard Branson's, which just burned down. So we want to have all of the stuff in the back of our head so that we have control and we are able uh, uh, to just kind of work a little bit more automatically. So let me uh, show you, let me ask you this question. So we all know the, the, uh, the saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? Now what if something doesn't have a name? Does it exist? What if something out there doesn't have a name, does it really exist? Well, it might exist, okay, but it doesn't have any meaning for us. We name things that have meaning for us. That's what we do as people, and the name is the most important part of that. So there's that old saying, uh, Eskimos have 100 words for snow, which is actually not true. Uh, they just have a very uh, robust language that puts a whole bunch of endings and beginnings on it. But the Swami people, this is up in Finland, where I lived. I lived in Finland for uh, three months in Rovaniemi, basically during the middle of winter. Uh, Rovaniemi is actually Santa's village. Um, but anyways, uh, the idea is, the Swami people have 300 different qualities of snow and winter pasture. All of them have a word. All of them have some sort of single word that explains it because they have and they live with this snow as they were evolving their language you know, on a daily basis. So they, they needed it. They needed to have a meaning for things like snow that would trap you, snow that you could walk on, snow that was easy to walk through, snow that had ice on top. They needed names for all of this because it was a matter of survival. It was a matter of an important meaning. You as a sculptor, you sculpt the face. So this is what you live and die by. If you sculpt the face really well in today's industry, your paycheck 
is going to be different than the guy next to you who does not sculpt the face really well. It's as simple as that. I've seen it. If you sculpt the face really well, then you are in a different position than somebody who doesn't. It is an asset to you immediately that has a cash flow difference for you. And I know we're all artists, and cash flow is not what we're interested in, but I'm also a father, and I'm interested in my daughter going to Harvard. So I'm starting now, right? <laughs> You know, I'm interested in my daughter having what she can have, what I can give her to move it forward. So money's not my concern. My daughter's my concern. My family's my concern. And you most likely have some similar situation. And so learning the face has immediate value to you. There is an artist out there, a guy named um, Eric Sosa. Eric Sosa came into ZBrush workshops, and uh, he came into one of my classes, and that's how I kind of learned about him. But I eventually ended up learning that Eric Sosa is one of the most sought after sculptors because he creates likenesses that are just out of this world. They're just amazing. Um, and that's his ticket. That's his ticket to relaxing as much as possible, or at least saving and providing for his family and all of that stuff. Anyways, all of that long story aside, you need to have words for what makes and breaks your survival. You should have at least three words for the brow. It's not just the brow. It's the superciliary arch. It's the glabella. It's the superorbital margin. It's the temporal line. It's a whole bunch. Excuse me. It's a whole bunch of things. What is it like when you have to, you know, show a piece of work to somebody, um, or you need to ask advice? And the only way you know how to ask advice is, you know, that space underneath the eye. You know, what's that like? Um, w what's going on there? That, that, you know, that space that's underneath the eye. No, not the eyelid. It's a little bit below the eyelid. It, you don't sound intelligent when you say that. And uh, trust me, I mean, uh, I spent my years sounding basically like a Luddite because I didn't really want to learn this, this Latin language. But as soon as I just gave in, I relaxed. I said, okay, I'm going to learn all of this stuff. It, w it had nothing to do with um, me starting to you know bow down to the man it was a hugely empowering uh, event you know that's when I started to look up things like the nasio jugular jugular juggle groove and keep in mind that you know we're sculptors we have it easy our pronunciation does not have to be right you know we get credit for trying Nasal juggle groove, jugular groove, juggle groove, what is that? I don't know. Okay? I do know that millions of dollars are spent fixing that area of the face. The nasal juggle groove. You go and you talk to a plastic surgeon, you throw that word out there, you are in a different league. Okay? That's a piece of information. Okay? That's what people are basically getting uh, removed. Those are, that's an eye lift, not an eye lift. But when you remove the eye bag underneath the eyes, that's the nasal juggle groove. Why does that happen? Why do, why does, why do we even get eye bags? Do you, do you understand the, the mechanics of why that happens? Basically, there is these, uh, there's these fasc this fascia that anchors to certain parts of your face. One of the parts that anchors is right underneath the orbit of your eye. And as you get older, that anchor loosens, and it doesn't hold the fat in as well, so the fat starts to come out, starts to drip down the face. So what plastic surgeons have to do is go in, and they cut that anchor, they you know, pull it in, tighten it up, sew it back together, and then go from there. Uh, but as a sculptor, you might not think that's important. But that's a position of power for me. I now know why that's happening. That means that I know where that particular point of influence is. I know why that's happening, so I know exactly how that's going to fall off. What about the inner eye? Uh, how many words do you have for the inner eye? Do you have at least five words? 
lacrimal, caruncula, medial palpebral ligament, tear trough, infraorbital margin. Do you have those five words? If you don't have those five words, how can you sculpt them? How can you have your pudding if you don't eat your meat, right? You gotta, you gotta prepare. Not to quote the wrong side of a, a Pink Floyd song, but you need to have your words in order to sculpt it. You draw what you know. That's the way it works. And it's complex. Tear trough is actually the same thing as a nasojuggle groove. It's the exact same thing. They're just called something different. Words around the orbit of the eye. Look at all those words. Glabella, supraciliary arch, superorbital margin, frontocephanoidal process of the zygomatic. I love that. When I first saw that word, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I'm going to go back in time, find whoever named that dang thing, and I'm going to have to assassinate him. And if we follow the Terminator 3 timeline, I might have to go back in time and assassinate his family too, right? Like, I'm going to go back in time, find the people who named all of these things, and I'm going to replace them with clones because that is ridiculous. Frontocephanoidal process. Come on. Help, help a guy out. Why would you do that? But at the end of the day, that's actually really a simple name. It's just they're, they're working like programmers, right? They don't understand the complexity that they live in. But basically, that's the frontal bones connection along with the cephanoidal bone, and it's the process of the zygomatic, which basically means it's basically it's something sticking out of the zygomatic connecting to the frontal bone and the cephanoidal bone. That's it. Once you know how to decode these, you have your magic decoder ring. It's actually kind of simple. Okay, you got the zygomatic. You have the infraorbital margin, the nasal jungle groove. You have the malar bag. What is a malar bag? Right? I mean, are they trying to get me to bring my own bag to the grocery market again? And this one's now made from malar trees, so it's the eco-friendly version, the eco-eco. Malar bag is basically your eye bag. It's basically that thing that you know is getting replaced or pulled tight. Bags under your eyes, you got problems with your malar bag. Orbital septum, that's what's loose. That's why the malar bag is gone berserk and now needs to be, you know, toned in. Frontal process of the maxilla. Okay, what bone is that? First off, right? Because you've got like frontal process, you've got maxilla, so what is that? It's the maxilla. That's the end. Frontal process. So it's obviously connecting to the frontal bone. And it's a process, so that means that that's the end. It's the pointy stick of the maxilla pointing right into the frontal process. A frontal process of the maxilla is the single most important thing for you to learn about the inside of the eye. It's in the book I wrote. It's in the anatomy workshop I teach. It's in the anatomy class I teach. Uh, it's hugely important. Frontal process and the lacrimal. You never see a lacrimal bone. But if you don't sculpt it in there, then people are going to see something's wrong with your sculpt. It's just the way it works. What about the words for the nose? What about the words for the nose? Nasal bone, lateral cartilage, tip defining point, the facet, alar facial juncture, nostril wing, columella, and alar fa facial groove. What about those points? Okay. I'm getting some questions here on people wanting to see exactly what I'm doing. So let me be very clear here. Let me just draw my lines. Let me see if this works okay. Nasal bone. Lateral cartilage. Tip defining point. Facet. Alar facial juncture. Nostril wings, pretty straightforward. Do you know what a columella is? Alar facial groove. Same thing, got doubled up. Can you still see my screen and hear my audio okay and, and see the drawings that I made? Is it all coming across? I had to use another program. Okay, cool. 
All right, so columella, alar facial groove, these are things that you don't hear in anatomy books. If you're going to go pro, you're going to get serious, and you want to change your paycheck, you know, you want to, you, you want to be committed to this, that where it's actually changing your life in some way, then you need to go past the anatomy books. You need to go past the artistic anatomy books. Where do you think I learned the tip defining point or the facet? Who on earth would have marked these tiny points? Plastic surgeons. Plastic surgeons have to communicate to a client how beautiful they're going to look when they're done doing and cutting into them. There's obviously a hurdle they have to get over. Not everybody just wants to be cut into for experimentation's sake, so you have to be convincing. So they have to define these things. It's part of their, their livelihood. It's part of, of their life. It's meaningful to them, like 300 words for snow. They have to have 300 words for the nose, for the eye, the mouth, because they live and die by their ability to uh, explain things to clients and get their clients to sign off on you know, face-altering, life-altering, potentially deadly operations. Every time you go underneath uh, anesthesia, risk for death. It's pretty crazy. Happens. Not uncommonly. So you need to have a language, okay, columella. Where did I learn that? Same place, plastic, sur uh, plastic surgeons. I did not read about that in uh, Elliot Goldfinger's book, Human Anatomy for Artists. Fantastic book, the most uh, thorough book of all. But it's still not having that. If I remember right, that's not where I learned it, and I'm not sure it has it. It might, but that's not where I learned it. Where I learned it was plastic surgeons. And I also learned from plastic surgeons about this little anchor underneath the eye. Remember we were just talking about the malar bag and the nasal juggle groove right here? Okay, And how the fat creeps down over the top of that and how that really makes it difficult for us to find the bone that's there. You know, I learned about the fact that the skin is basically anchored underneath here and that's causing that to fold over. How would I explain that? Yeah, it'd be right here. So it's causing it to fold over as part of the skin pushes back underneath and the rest moves forward. Knowing that puts me in power, puts me in a position of strength when I'm doing things. Learning anatomy is about learning your vocabulary, building your sculpting vocabulary. It's about ass assigning meaning to certain places so that you can dive in and learn more about them. The problem with putting words and names uh, together is that you have to learn them one at a time. That's the big problem. And there's no way around it. If you're going to learn a language, how are you going to start? You're going to start by looking at the dictionary, looking at grammar, taking some classes, interacting with people, and learning one word at a time, and then trying to use that word in a sentence. That's the big thing. You learn a language, you have to learn to use that word in a sentence so that you learn to ascribe meaning to it. So what we have to do as sculptors, you have to learn these words and then you have to sculpt to put it into action. So this is my marketing moment. What are you waiting for? Come visit me at ZBrush Workshops. And now let's take a look at just sculpting. Let's take a look at ZBrush and um, see what we can do to understand or to kind of just jump start us. We're uh, 40 minutes into the presentation and uh, we have about another 20 minutes on so there's not a lot I can do in that time frame but there is one really important thing that I can do and that is start out properly. Everybody wants to jump in when they get a face and you want to start selecting the move brush, you want to pull the jaw down, start ramping things around 
Then you want to get in with clay brush. This is, this is what happens when we begin. Okay, I'm going to go kind of fast, so let me know if our software slows down and you lose me. Give me a shout out and questions. Okay. Now, I don't know if you're noticing this, but I'm already in trouble. I'm having to add, having to subtract. My additions are not behaving correctly. I'm, I'm losing control. That wasn't supposed to happen. I should have modified my clay brush. Should have modified the settings to make it better. But I spent all my time on the front of the face. Now my proportions are off. So I've got to go back in and change my proportions and give them basically a back of the skull. Okay, fine, fair enough. If you know anatomy, you can get yourself out of any trouble. Once you know the names, once you know the map, I've just I've held my screen there for a moment in case you're wondering, but if you're lost or if you're trudging through what I call the valley of the suck, anatomy is going to be what gets you out. Anatomy is your map. Okay, now I didn't start this out with any sense of structure or any proper sense of approach. Just because we're in the computer and we can do anything does not mean that we're Neo and it does not mean that we have control over the matrix. The matrix still owns you. You're still hooked up. You're still in the pod chamber generating electricity for it. You only have the ability that the true Neo, Ofer Alon, has given us. Okay? Ofer is in connection with artists and the machine code language. So he, as our one and only Neo, is providing us with the, uh, the tools that we need to free ourselves. But at the end of the day, just because you aren't working with clay, you still have to work within certain parameters. And you have to work with a certain sense of craftsmanship. Um, I didn't really introduce myself at the beginning. I just started talking. But if you don't know uh, any of my background, I was part of development at Pixelogic. And one of my crown jewels was ZBrush 3 and then ZBrush 3.1. I even was able to do some interface creation with ZBrush 3 and then a bug in ZBrush made them take it out. So I created this thing called Rapid Start. And uh, then it rapidly unstarted and disappeared. ZBrush, in terms of its development, is always thinking about workflow. Workflow is a huge part of what they do. And when they create a feature, like let's say when they create, uh, let's go back in time, um, extraction, mesh extraction. Right, I can say this now because it's actually its lifespan has basically run through. But when mesh extraction was created, it wasn't, hey, let's mask and extract. You know, I, I don't know. That's kind of like what Maya does when you, you know, hide a bunch of faces and extrude a bunch of faces. That's kind of what it does, right? Uh, mesh extraction might have seemed similar to that in the beginning. But there is an entire workflow for mesh extraction. Okay, mesh extraction was a stage one. Shadowbox, a stage two. You didn't even see Shadowbox coming. But there's this um, Meets Meyer. I don't know if you know Meets Meyer, but he was one of the first major ZBrush artists. But Meets Meyer believes that Ofer is from the future. And Ofer is just the, he's the head of development now. Uh, but it, all of this was his brainchild. Uh, and Meets was convinced Ofer was from the future because basically, these tools were coming out of nowhere uh, and having immediate and direct impact on our lives. And uh, the key to, to their success, the development team's success, is that when they create something like mesh extraction, they don't just stop there. They think through the entire process. What would it be like if you create a, me uh, a, a mesh just by masking on the surface? What if you can mask in thin air? What if then you can mask in thin air and do all these other things? You know, that's what's powerful about this software. And uh, a really good example is Shadowbox and the clip brushes. 
Shadow box, you create fast. Clip brushes, you create hard surfaces fast. They're designed to work together. Workflow is important. All right, I'm going to mess with my screen now. But basically, when you're sculpting, you want a workflow. You want something that you do where it's not haphazard, and you're lucky to have a successful sculpt. If, if you feel lucky to have a successful sculpt, then you're still approaching this like an amateur. You need to dig in and get repeatable results. Get results that you know you can get any time a client comes to you and says, uh, God, I really need just a really quick face for this body. I've, I've scanned in this little piece. I just need you to do a couple of tweaks to this face and um, add some flowing hair. You know, you need to have a system, you need to have a process where you can get these things done quickly. Um, so, workflow is important, always important, but if you have knowledge, you can always find your way out of being lost. So, while that might have looked like crap, I know that I just need to smooth a couple of places. I need to adjust a couple of planes, check a couple of measurements, halfway point, okay, and then I need to check width. So I'm using a Cintiq right now, and on that Cintiq I just put my cursor against the screen. Just like you would if you were drawing and you were holding your pencil out in front of you to measure something. Okay, I know from experience and because I love that word, the frontocephenoidal process, I already know that I need to put in a boom, boom, and a boom. I need, you know, you like my language, you like my words, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I need to put in this triple arch. What is it? Well, it's the zygomatic bone, right? Then the frontocephenoidal process, the overhang, temporal line, and then the plane transition to the frontal eminence. I already know that, and what's really important to note is that you never saw me do that. You never saw me once touch the frontocephenoidal process, but there it is. You would have never guessed that I was even thinking about the overhang or the orbit of the eye, but it was built into my every move. What was going on was built into everything. It was built into exactly what vertice I grab. And that's not something that you just, you know, you, somebody just says, oh, well, grab that vertice and, and you're there. No, that's, that's like a tennis pro, you know. You, a tennis pro knows where they need to be to get the best out of their, you know, the shot depending on the trajectory of it coming towards them or the most likely trajectory coming towards them. And they learn that because they play tennis every single day and that's how they make their living. You make your living as a sculptor. You have to know where the best place is to grab a point and how that's going to affect it. Is it going to leave it curved or is it going to flatten it perfectly between the two points inside your brain you already know you want it to adjust to? These are the things that are really important. It's all the automatic stuff all of that stuff that's just in the back of my head, it's part of the map uh, that I have. It's part of the words, you know, because what do I know here? I know that the glabella is right there. I know that the glabella tends to shoot off and then the superorbital margin and the overhang and the frontal cephanoidal process, frontal process of the maxilla, you know, all of that tends to all happen there. I need to move that in. But I'm mentally thinking, okay, here is one point, here is another point. I need to change the angle in between them, but I'll leave those two points as they are. Uh, someone's asking, what am I using to draw on the screen? And this is uh, Camtasia. But don't tell anybody because it's kind of like magic when I do it. So I don't like them to know it's, it's actually not magic. So uh, here we go, moving that, moving that, I'm going to move the side of the nose in, temporal line, 
I'm going to get the zygomatic. Perspective is not in. Doing a face without perspective on, you're going to have problems. You might not sculpt perspective all the time. A friend of mine, Cesar, hates it. But if you don't turn it on, you're going to have problems. If you don't turn it on at some point, I'll say it that way. Okay, look at now I'm establishing structure, elements. Let me just back up. What did I hit? Front uh, overhang, basically. Glabella, temporal line, zygomatic bone, as well as the high point of the zygomatic bone, the jaw. I also then helped to establish the masseter. But I didn't call it the masseter. This is actually a triangle. And there's another triangle right here. These are all triangles. I have them in my mind. I'm trying to make sure that they're succinct, make sure that in my sculpt it's there. So I'm looking at these different angles. Is that a triangle? Yes, that is a triangle. Maybe it could go over a little bit. All part of this mental math that's going on. I know uh, plenty of engineers that actually become sculptors. And there are some really great examples in history because the ability to translate in 3D in your brain these spatial coordinates is hugely important. Okay, now what am I moving right there? Let's just back up. I have a hierarchy of what I'm doing here. Tip defining point. Frontal process of the maxilla. Nodule at the side of the mouth. Okay, the chin. Uh, this is actually more the alveolar. I'm really trying to get the barrel of the mouth. And anatomists call that the alveolar. Don't ask me to spell it. It's hard enough to be able to pronunciate that. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, let me see, what else did I do? Yeah, I really want the side plane at the nose, so I'm hoping to keep that. I really want the down plane. And this was really important, getting the width of that chin. That was really an important part. Uh, but I don't put lips in. You don't see lips. I don't have lips. Sculpted in this. There's no sense sculpting lips. Lips are something that exists on top of teeth. This is part of the retraining. When you're learning faces when you're young, you look at people's mouths because their mouth is a source of expression, emotion, and it's going to tell you whether you get something or you're not going to get something. But it's not, it's not, um, <laughs> sorry, somebody just said something in chat about choked me. Uh, and we'll just start over from there. That was a complete mind change. So now, Next things I'm going to look for, planes. How do we do and what are the planes that we're looking for? I hit some anatomy points, but you didn't see me hitting a lot of anatomy points. Okay? You didn't see me hitting a lot. You're not going to see me hitting a lot right now, but, but it is built into everything I do. So I already know from experience, the glabella is going to tend to raise, and then the overhang comes in like this. Okay, that I already know happens. So I build that in. I know it's part of the anatomy, and um, and then uh, you know it's just something that's in my planes. Okay, I might hit a couple of points, make sure that that has a little bit more verve, and then I'm going to straighten it out. Now I saw in uh, a workshop in that workshop with Richard, I saw him do this really awesome thing, and I've tried to do it in clay. But basically, he would do what I just did. Let me explain that. Uh, where can I do it? He would put a piece of clay down. It almost appeared haphazard where he put it, although I severely doubt it was. He'd put a piece of clay down and then shape it immediately. The first thing he'd do: put the clay down, shape it, integrate it and then move on. Shape it, integrate it, and then move on. Okay, another thing to keep in mind, the jaw. 
you know, it's, it's not enough to just say, hey, that's a straight line. Because you reach a point in your sculpting where you start to look at this stuff and you're just like, well, it looks good. It's okay, but it's not that good. That's what happened to me. You can go back on YouTube and see my face sculpts, which I was just kind of, you know, I was basically uh, doing scripting, uh, beta testing, the feature. I was a product manager. I was head of training. My job wasn't to be this awesome sculptor and to do things really well. My job was very simple. It was to just uh, do these things moderately well and get this stuff going. But, but I just I realized, you know, I was at a end point. Now, and I'm traditionally trained. You know, I can draw fairly well, and, and I, I learned from really really good teachers: Al Gurry, uh, Renee Falks, and Stuart Feldman was my sculptor teacher. Okay, these are all fantastic people who gave me everything that I have, uh, traditionally speaking. But I wasn't using it often enough, and I wasn't taking my artwork seriously enough. I didn't know enough about the names. I didn't know enough about the individual forms. Well, are you aware of the shape of the jaw? Are you aware that it is curving out here and then comes back? If you're aware of that, then you push in ever so slightly you pull out ever so slightly and your sculpt suddenly looks better and nobody would know why it just looks better that's the kind of thing that we want to get out of anatomy that like leveling up without any sense or almost where it's like magic right I, I love it because of that but here I started out with a mess and I was able to put structure uh, into place. I was able to get something reasonably well. Now let me bring in a couple of models. Uh, Megan. And let's save this one in case something happens because these files are kind of large. Okay, here's an early face sculpt a bit ago. But there's a lot going on in the inside of the eye that I want to make sure you're aware of. Frontal process of the maxilla. Okay. Frontal process, I'm going to outline in red. What's this shape right in here? How is the plane of the glabella transitioning? Notice that that's the underplane. Notice how it transitions where it's actually an above plane. And then the fat for the eye. Okay. Then you get this little space. It's like no man's land in there. How does all of this work with the side of the nose? Pretty well. What's going on in the corner here? What is this trough? Tear trough, nasal juggle, jugular, yada yada. Where's the malar bag, right? Well, that's going to come. It's going to happen. No plastic surgeon can keep it away forever. But there's a lot of things going on in the corner of that eye that you don't really think about. And if you don't have your names, Okay, lacrimal. That was huge for me. I learned the lacrimal and the frontal process at the same time. How did I learn them? Gray's Anatomy. For free at Bartlebees.com. And a lot of patience. Because you gotta read a lot of stuff. And you got to find the right page. And you not only that, but you got to go in there and you got to find that one part that is about the, uh, about the bone structure. There's only like one that's about the bone structure. And it has the detailed information about the troughs, the, all these different parts. Okay? That's free information. You don't have to take a workshop from me. You don't have to get a DVD. You don't have to do anything. You just have to start taking yourself more seriously, sit down with Gray's Anatomy, find these names, go on a naming mission. There is a reason why men throughout history 
have named every single thing they encounter. You discover new virgin land, the first thing you do is put a name on it. And that's because without a name, it doesn't have any real meaning. You can't tell somebody, hey, I discovered this non-named land. You know, that doesn't have as much, uh, you know, doesn't have as much sway as saying, uh, I discovered the new America. You know, and then suddenly now you're somebody in history. So names are important. Go on a naming mission. Find out what the names of all these bumps are on the face. Once you find a name out, you connect it with another name. You start building that map, right? You start doing things like finding that frontal process, not the frontal process, you start finding the um, uh, infraorbital triangle. You may have heard me tell this story before, but I love telling this story. I discovered the infraorbital triangle. Unfortunately, I did it roughly 150 years after somebody else discovered it. But that does not mean that I didn't discover it. And when I discovered it, I had about two hours of pure joy where I came up with a whole bunch of names. I have a notebook filled with names. And the one that I keep is called the Triangle of Contention. Why somebody would call it the infraorbital just is boring. Triangle of contention has meaning, you know, discovered by Ryan Kingsline. The triangle of contention. What is it? It's the zygomatic major on one side, nose on the other, nasal labial fold, or the orbit, really the outside of that orbicularis oris, the mouth muscle, and then the zygomatic. And all of that is cheek fat. And it's cheek fat which as you age becomes more of a landslide and starts to drop down there like a bulldog and then you see this thing this little anchor point right here right this it starts to drop down over it well anytime it's dropping down and it's creating this tension too you think about the nasal juggle and what happens when eye bags happen here there is basically fascia that goes from the skin to the bone. And that's what happens in here. There's fascia that goes from the skin to the bone. And then the fat just kind of swells out over the top of that. Just swells out over the top. Um, but, you know, now I know that. It was a conversation with a plastic surgeon friend. Um, we were talking about the face, and uh, he was describing to me the facelift procedure where the first thing they do is. Um, well, basically, the face slips off very easily, except for those points, except for a couple of points under the eye, uh, right here, I think behind the ear, and there was something about right there. Except for a couple of points there where you just have to slice it, the face just comes right off. Really weird. Don't want to know much more about it than that. But knowing that puts me in a position of power when I have to go in and sculpt some of these uh, these forms, and I need to age her. I'm going to know exactly what to age, where to age, things like that. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really important is being able to see through the model. So here we've got her sculpt. Maybe you need to do an exercise where you sculpt the muscles or the bones inside her face. Do it on a layer, like I did. That's just painted on a layer, sculpted on a layer, sorry. I cut her nose out, too. I even added them back. I gave her nose again, and then I gave her some cheek fat. And that alone will teach you a lot about the eye. The brow, the inner corner of the eye, because you're going to want to start to understand what are these planes doing. Well, here's that frontal process. It's connecting in to the glabella the lacrimal, all that stuff, the nasal bone, the side. You want to start to force yourself to be learning uh, all of these things, to get in and get uh, in depth. Okay, so I want to pause for a second. I've been talking for an hour straight, and um, I'll leave this section of her brow up. I'm going to go through the chat real quick. There's a couple of things I want to do now. One, I want to just answer some questions, so if, if you've got questions now is a great time to put them in the question thing. Uh, and then 
Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we do at ZBrush Workshops. One of the uh, workshops that I think is really important, and I'm going to show one of my friends Martin's work, uh, before and after kind of style, and show what's really awesome about uh, the things that he picked out. I'm really proud of what he did. And then uh, we'll go from there. A lot of questions. Uh, let's see, recordings, yes, uh, Jay can answer those things. I do believe it's all being recorded and will be available. I'm recording some of it, but not all. Okay, like Bern Hogarth's books. Uh, Bern Hogarth explained to me one way I thought was really, really um, good, and that is that Bern Hogarth is the one that gets you in. Uh, I know his son Michael Hogarth and his wife Pam is a, a good friend of mine. She's a wonderful woman working in the industry. And um, uh, there's a whole bunch of stories about Bern uh, Hogarth and his teaching method and all of that stuff. Uh, I, with any anatomy book, I don't want to say yes, no, I don't want to say good, bad. They all have value, 100%. And Bern Hogarth is going to be one of those guys that is immediately accessible to not just you and me, but to like 12-year-olds, to um, the 14-year-olds. It's, it's that little piece of candy that can get them into all of this stuff. And then they learn later on, wow, it's not really just candy. It's actually, you know, it's a ton of information in what Bern Hogarth's done. Um, available on YouTube, not sure. Uh, da, 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 da. Hey guys, the uh, the webinar is actually going to be rebroadcast on YouTube and Vimeo. Just check out the uh, the Image Metric site. It'll be available in about a week. Cool. Uh, let's see. Rapid start. Rapid, rapid no longer start. It's just an interface to mimic Maya. Somebody is asking what Rapid Start did, which is some a script I wrote for ZBrush. Um, but it is long dead. Maximum poly count with a sphere. I go up to mini polygon, mini millions, four million, something like that. Uh, let's see. I do not change the perspective. Somebody's asking about the camera perspective. I know people do. Um, I don't change it. Uh, you might have to. Uh, but I would only do it if I was connecting with Maya and I, I had some testing phase to find out what was good. But I, honestly, I just don't do it. It's not worth it, and it's better just to get into um, ZBrush or get into Maya, sorry, and check it. All right, DaVinci, da Vinci's formulas for the face are more like grids that define proportions without perspective. If he drew orthographic views without based on if he drew orthographic views on paper, so can I sculpt without perspective based on DaVinci's formula? Uh, you mean orthogonal view? Yes, Mohammed. Uh, yeah. You, you got to go to orthographic view sometimes, sure, and um, and you definitely got to go when you're doing measurements at some points. Uh, or what I tend to do with measurements is I set my measurements. So for example, I want to do a one head width, so I'll go into transpose, drag up for one head, and I'll make sure that that's set to be one head, and drag it down. Make sure that the length of that is one head. Then I go into preference, transpose units, and I set that to one. Now, anytime I make a measurement, whether it's perspective or not, I can go from one side of the head to the other side. And then I can see my units up here on the top, 0.62. So that's, that's how I use measurements uh, nowadays. But actually, I can show you something that I just I love. I've been playing with the golden rule uh, lately. Okay. Uh, trim brush. Which trim dynamic brush are you using? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. I'm using trim dynamic. I'm not using trim adaptive. And I'm just using the default trim uh, dynamic. Uh, Mans is asking, uh, Anatomy 2.0 available as a workshop. Uh, Anatomy 2.0 is a class that I run at um, ZBrush Workshops, for those who don't know. And it uh, will it's not possible to make it a workshop. We already have something like three hours of content. I've already put six modules together. We've got another four modules to go. Um, so it literally wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. It's too much information. 
Uh, let's see, when you put the model skull on a layer, do you create it as a layer and then extract it as a subtool? Um, it's just a layer. I don't extract as a subtool. Uh, I might, but no, I would just do it as a layer. Next anatomy class, uh, I don't know, but um, I'll, I do have something coming up. I have a sculpting the face workshop, uh, which I decided to do today. I'll explain that here in a second, though. Um, yeah, uh, Daniel is asking, uh, when you said layer, you mean adding a subtool. A lot of people get confused between the subtool palette and the layer. They see subtools and layers as the same thing, but they're not. Uh, subtools are always for separate objects, separate geometry, that's it. Uh, layers are going to change based on what subtool is selected. Uh, someone's asking the size of an eyeball. And I don't know if you know this, but something we cover in the anatomy of the face workshop, the eyeball has an actual measurement. Forensic uh, facial reconstruction science kind of averages it out. And if I remember correctly, it's 24 uh, millimeters, which should put it at about two and a half centimeters, thereabouts. Um, maybe, I don't know why I'm thinking 28. Uh, but then the head itself is supposed to be like, let's say, nine inches. So you can do some math and actually inside of ZBrush you get absolute measurements down to the millimeter. That's what I do in the workshop anyways. Uh, that was quite useful because then I got the exact millimeter dimension of an eyeball. Uh, so I like to actually just get the exact measurement. I don't like to mess around with it. Uh, let's see. Best perspective settings. I don't change my perspective settings by usual. Um, if your goal is to print, absolutely, Catherine, make sure you get it into a third party program and look. Now, ZBrush is supposed to have a real world perspective. I'm telling you that that's what development told me. It's what they t I was there when they did the last, um, the last change uh, calculation modifications. Uh, it was absolutely real world coordinates, but the problem is when you're in ZBrush, you're not in the real world. So <laughs> your model, the size has already changed. Um, so yeah, you have to get into another app just to see. Uh, any value to start low poly, work your way up? Um, or do I work high res all the time? Uh, there are both, both are, po both are beneficial. Uh, and uh, I, I honestly, I do both. Uh, it depends. Faces are easier to do sometimes if I just jump in and go high res. If I was to do a werewolf, I would probably go low res and build it up more slowly because uh, it's a little bit easier um, to manage the complexity. Uh, Portuguese is not my, um, my next thing to learn, but I'll put it on there. <laughs> uh, I am horrible with languages. I tried Czech once. That was not successful. Uh, features of ZBrush, the new one. I can't talk too much about it, uh, but it's awesome. I can say that. How long did it take me to learn anatomy correctly? I'll let you know when I do learn anatomy correctly. I, I'm sure that's going to come any day, but I do not know. Uh, eyeball, yeah, Daniel, I just mentioned the size of the eyeball. Uh, work from scans, uh, I don't generally work from scans, although I do have scans and um, and I do check scans with measurements occasionally. I think it's a disservice for me to not check my scans more often, though, to be honest with you. Uh, they have so much information. Uh, Michael, do you consider differences in skull structure between male and female different races when sculpting? Uh, that would be nice if my brain could do that. And uh, sometimes it will, depending on if that's the character, you know. You got obviously, if you're sculpting a werewolf, you got to think about the differences between uh, human and canine. Um, so yeah, those are part of it, but then there's always an adjustment phase where, where I make it happen or not. Uh, lots of questions. Um, Anatomy 2.0 without a regular class, without teacher instruction, that, Mike, I'm not sure. Uh, oh yeah, somebody told me 25 millimeters for the eye. Great, thanks guys. Or the size of a quarter. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to go through here a rest. All right, and we're going to run out of time. Okay, Catherine. I think that's Catherine. I don't see it here, but I think that's Catherine 
do we? Yeah, I just pulled it out. Cool. Uh, so Catherine's mentioning uh, physical anthropology texts are great for gender and ethnic variations. Uh, absolutely agree. Forensic uh, reconstruction science is also really showing the way uh, for me in a lot of those things. Uh, and especially one of these really key bits of information, which is that uh, if a forensic scientist only has the skull, their accuracy rating for judging male and female is hugely diminished. If you throw a pelvis in there, and you've got the pelvis of the, you know, the, the deceased, the accuracy is significantly higher, going up, I think if I remember correctly, 80%. So, big difference. The skull isn't the big difference, the pelvic bone is the big difference. Uh, Paul McDonald's image planes for a likeness. Um, yes and no. Image planes are both uh, the work of an angel and the work of the devil. They do both good and bad, and if you depend on them, uh, you're in, you know, you're both, they're useful, but then they're not. You need to learn the names. No image is going to help you unless you know that's the frontal process. Basically, an image is a new wilderness for you to decipher. And whenever I work with image planes, uh, I always uh, decipher them. I always try to understand them. All right, uh, Karen Taylor is the forensic scientist you need to look up. Uh, I used a couple of her measurements in the Anatomy of the Face workshop. Really cool one where the size of the, the height of the teeth determine the height of the lips. Thought that was pretty awesome. All right, and uh, let's start wrapping this up. Um, so I want to just share with you guys a little bit of what we're doing at ZBrush Workshops, and uh, then I want to. Is that there? Yeah. Let me just move it over. I have a new class, which I decided to do just today, because uh, Jay and everybody got me really fascinated with um, this idea of sculpting the face. I had to create the presentation, started getting me thinking about the words and all of that stuff, and I realized, you know, you know, we don't just need anatomy. You need words, you need practice, and you need uh, to really get in there. So if you go to ZBrush Workshops, I've just put this up. And uh, you can just go to the front page, you see the class. Uh, but you can enter your name and email. Uh, and I provide the first four chapters of the Anatomy of the Face workshop. We've actually kind of gone over the first four chapters to some extent. But I've also put them in here uh, when you give your name and address. But this is a class I think is going to start in uh, mid-September is when I'm aiming. So most likely the 15th. Uh, it will start out normal, and then we'll switch over to the new ZBrush tools uh, if they're applicable. But make sure you check that out. I'll start sending out more information about it as I go. But otherwise, uh, take, uh, keep in mind the classes we run and the workshops. The Anatomy of the Face is the workshop that even got my, uh, even connected Jay and, uh, and me in image metrics. So anatomy of the face is uh, a lot of information on anatomy, skull, it's step by step, and uh, it's forensic facial reconstruction. We do tissue depth, thickness, all of it in ZBrush. So uh, all of it done fairly easily. I was really happy with the new features in ZBrush that allowed me to do this. Uh, so if that's it, I think we're in great shape. Um, the last question I'll take is uh, somebody's asking for some people who, well, advice for struggling with likenesses. That's the, that's the last question I'll have time to answer. Uh, struggling with likenesses is, is basically sculpting a likeness. If you're sculpting it, you're struggling with it. Uh, it's just par for the course. But the most important thing, the thing that I think is really essential is you start to learn these words. You, you start to learn the frontal process and you start to learn the lacrimal and, uh, and those things. And that actually brings me over to one of my students, uh, Martin. And uh, Martin McGee uh, started out, these are the sculpts we were working with. And these, these have a likeness of the, uh, of the model and the reference, but they're missing certain things. They're missing a really strong sense of the zygomatic bone. They're missing a sense of that uh, alar facial juncture, sense of the nodule, and how the nodule is a separate group of fibers 
from the fibers that are coming down into the lips. And then how do these guys interact with the fibers at the bottom of the mouth, right? The bottom, the bottom of the lip, the bottom lip is subservient to the upper lip. So it's disappearing underneath it. You have to know that. But then it's complicated by the fact that the muscle fibers might disappear underneath it, but that doesn't mean the fat does. So sometimes you get these little hits, these little complexities um, where the lips get harder. But you have to understand the words and the anatomy. And what Martin, I, I was just incredibly happy to see his success once he posted um, this. So we're going from this sculpt, which is a likeness, to this sculpt, which just has a beautiful rendering on that inside corner of the eye. And it has a very subtle treatment of the brow. You can see the glabella. You can see this space, this nasal jugular groove, which I extend into the corner of the eye. You can see how the lower eyelid has that eye portion, which sticks to the eye, and then it has the portion which basically sticks or transitions to the zygomatic. Okay? You get the alar facial juncture. You get the nostril wing. You get the alar cartilage. All of these things Martin was starting to put in, and we were doing a couple of one-to-one -one sessions, uh, which is what we do at ZBrush Workshops. Um, they're just basically web meetings where I just meet with the students. And uh, Martin was, and I were just working through the differences. And uh, one day he shows up and he's got suddenly uh, Gailey sculpted here. Uh, so much more beautifully rendered uh, than the sculpts that he was doing before because in his brain he had more names. He had more things to ascribe and study. So thank you Martin. You're, Martin's actually in this meeting right now, but thank you Martin for sharing, allowing me to share that. And uh, the key thing for everybody else is just that you have to learn names and once you learn names then you can start to define and decide you know how does all of this look and work uh, together you start to move things around but at least you're in a position of strength and uh, last thing I'm going to end it on this is actually the update I'm doing for the anatomy of face workshop but uh, one thing you'll notice these are golden rule measurements. So you can take these measurements. These are, they're not aligned. They're actually aligned for a different sculpt. But you can take these measurements where you go corner or top of the head to the pupil, and then the pupil to the lip line. Hairline, bottom of the nose, bottom of the nose, bottom of the chin. That's mathematical beauty happening right there. That's a golden measure. That is a one point yadi yadi yadi. Right? I don't have the word for it, but yadi yadi worked. I do, though, have the measurement. And that's the next thing that I really want to be focusing on. I want to be uh, focusing on how do you create beauty, not just land upon it like some gift from the gods. How do you create it? The golden mean. How do you find that measurement? They, uh, they call it the golden mean. They call it the golden rule. They call it uh, phi, not pi. Um, 0.618, thanks, Seth. Uh, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it has value to us. And it can help us improve things. So all of that said, uh, I'm going to bid you guys farewell. Thank you so much for being part of the presentation and uh, thank you very much for asking all the questions and thank you Jay and Image Metrics for having me and letting me go a half hour overtime thanks to everybody who stayed and uh, take care good luck with your sculpting Ryan thanks very much for uh, for doing this with us man it was excellent webinar I'm sure we all learned a lot and uh, everybody make sure to check out zbrushworkshops.com if you haven't already and uh, Please check out uh, image-metrics.com for more information about our company and our software. And uh, we hope to see all you guys at the next uh, webinar. We'll keep you updated through email, uh, as well as uh, you can check our Twitter feed and our Facebook and, of course, our web forums where we have all the information. And thanks a lot for coming, everybody.